often I, the word introduce is correct <laughs> because uh, Elizabeth Ersick has already been introduced to us and is a, a part of us. As you recall, she began interviewing uh, as far back as 2005 and many, many of us in this room have been a part of her search and of her interviewing. Elizabeth is Professor of Religious Studies, Mesa Community College, Mesa, Arizona. And the results of, uh, actually, it was while she was a graduate student at uh, Yale Divinity School mm -hmm. that she became interested in the topic of gender and God. And um, I, I don't know how you got connected to us, Elizabeth. I should have looked it up before I wrote this introduction. But uh, I remember meeting you in um, the chapel in Litchfield. It was the, the third colloquium, wisdom colloquium, we had done. And it was being conducted by Andrew Harvey. I don't know if anyone here was there. But uh, it was a very... Um, um, I don't know, upsetting time. <laughs> uh, it was a wonderful time, but it was also a time of confusion um, with, you know, this whole subject of Mary um, and, and uh, Andrew Harvey and mysticism and the gurus and the ashrams of India. It, it all got confused in my head. And we were going up to the chapel to, um, to, to do a prayer on acquiring divine wisdom. And as I walked into the chapel, I heard the strings of a cello playing in the sanctuary. And I looked over, and it was Elizabeth mm -hmm. playing this music. And all of a sudden, all the confusion that I felt just melted away from me. I took a deep breath, and I said, bless that woman. <laughs> yeah, and, and I sat down, and I began to focus on a prayer that was for the acquiring of wisdom, <laughs> but your music uh, really um, was was so um, so needed and so satisfying and so fulfilling at that moment. And that's my first uh, meeting with you uh, uh, that that I recall, besides the interviews, the many interviews that took place. And uh, those interviews were part of your dissertation, finally, and then more importantly, became a part of a book that um, uh, is titled, here I have the book in my hand, Women, Ritual, and Power. And it's by printed by Sunni Press. And the Daughters of Wisdom are in the second chapter. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is a compilation of, of many of the interviews uh, that uh, Elizabeth took. And, and um, I would say held preciously in her hands and at the same time maintained her own voice in presenting our experience of wisdom. Uh, the aim of her book, um, she says, quite simply, is this, to explore feminist liturgical reform as a lens to investigate gender and power dynamic in churches. And so maybe, Elizabeth, that's the question we have to ask you. How has that been going? <laughs> so it is with great pride and um, joy that I introduce to you Elizabeth Ersick of Arizona. Thank you, Sister Anne. Um, I, I think I've had goosebumps um, many times in the last, I came in last evening, Sister Joan picked me up from the train station. I had uh, dinner with the community that lives at the provincial house as well as the local community that was there. Um, and many times we, I started to hear things and we were remembering things. I actually, um, you reminded me that I played cello at that colloquium and I, I remember how powerful it was because not only, I was playing cello to accompany a dancer that had come out from St. John the Divine. And it wasn't that many years after September 11th. It was in 2003 that that colloquium was. And she was dancing um, Our Lady of Guadalupe, if I remember, with a big veil of the sorrow of New York and how you find transformation coming out of that. 
And um, when Anne references Andrew Harvey as well, um, the word I was going to use was a dynamic weekend. <laughs> he, um, I can tell you because I've heard him speak to other groups, he is a, he challenges, he's a bit in your face, and hopefully the pieces come together in a new way on the other side. And actually what I did write in my book, the colloquiums went for five years, right? And the two years after Andrew was a coming back to sourcing people who would know your tradition. Um, he knew Montfort from his perspective, um, but the people that came to you in the following years um, spoke from within the envelope of your tradition. And I even commented in the book that um, some of the power of you as daughters following wisdom this way is that you are completely faithful to the Catholic teachings, to the sourcing in the Bible, and to the way that Catholic theology has developed, and certainly through the contribution of Montfort to this beautiful tradition that we all practice. Um, and um, so it was beautiful to see that. Um, let me take a step back for a couple of you that um, I didn't get to meet the first time around. Um, and I'd like to share how I met the daughters, what inspired me to write the book, a couple of the um, things that have stayed with me all these years, and then to end with a, uh, a generous but fervent invitation that you continue sharing with the world because of the beauty of what you have. So, first, how did I meet the daughters? I was working at a Catholic church in Greenwich, Connecticut, and attending Yale Divinity School. I brought a group from our church to the Montfort Shrine, the Lords in Litchfield, for the blessing of the motorcycles. Oh, I wow. had never seen that. <laughs> pine boughs and water fly and all these bikers with tattoos I had never seen. And that was my opening to the beauty of my fortune spirituality. Just get in there with everybody. Um, and um, on a break, I guess I wasn't the best leader for my church because everybody had disappeared. Um, they went to the cafeteria, or they did, and there I was, standing in front of the altar, and Father Don LaSalle was on the altar sweeping up, and what I heard over the loudspeakers was a cello and a piano playing. Those are my two musical instruments. With these cathedral of trees, and I prayed, I said, God, I would love to play music at this shrine. And I went up to him and introduced myself, and um, he said, well, it just happens that our musicians are having to leave if you ever want to come up and play. And when he heard I was from about an hour and a half away, he said, we could easily put you up in the retreat house to make it easier for your driving. And with that, it was the Montfort fathers, Tom Poth and Don LaSalle um, and Jean, Father Jean, were the three there at the time. Um, welcomed me in. Um, it was a beautiful connection. A few months after that, I participated in a sacred music concert there that the Daughters of Wisdom, who were living down the road at Wisdom House, came to. And at the end of it, um, Sister Camille, as only Sister Camille could do, she <coughs> ran across the room and she said, we're the Daughters of Wisdom. And she pointed to the sisters across the room who were all going like this. And I'm like, wonderful. And, um, and she said, we heard your music, but we heard your prayer. And she invited me to Wisdom House the next day for a tour. And we're walking through the building, going down to the chapel, and she's explaining how the Daughters of Wisdom pray to Wisdom, and that for her and for some of you in the order, calling Wisdom Sophia, the Greek word, which is also a female name, had special meaning for her. And when she said that, I actually held on to the banister because I felt a little dizzy. Just hearing the word, just hearing that name, in that context, and something took my heart. And I went back to Yale, and I said, I want to find out who Lady Wisdom is in the scripture. 
I found an Old Testament scholar and did a private tutorial with her just to learn the scripture. I have no, I would not say I am an expert like all of you, but at least an introduction. And then I came to want to learn more about your order. And I came in for one of my term papers, I interviewed some of the sisters, mostly I think up in Litchfield. Okay, so fast forward, I finish at Yale, I get hired to teach world religions in Arizona, and I'm at a community college. I'm at the largest two-year college for religious studies in the nation. There are five of us teaching full-time. We have over 20,000 students at our school. Um, it's very unusual arrangement, but I'm very blessed. I also now teach our women in religion course, and we have a course in American Indian religions because we have 17 tribes federally recognized in the state of it. So very different from Connecticut, but a wonderful expansion of my own knowledge. I was able to complete a PhD in um, religious studies with a specialty in women in religion, and what I brought forward was what I had started with the daughters. They were very excited for me to pursue this, and so that is why I reached out to Anne Gray. Well, she it first started with you, Evelyn, the first part when I was at Yale, and then Anne was provincial once I got into the PhD research. Now here we are with Kathy. I feel like we've just, I keep growing with the congregation. Um, and we're not getting older, we're just getting better. <laughs> so um, the, the research was wonderful. Um, and um, for the PhD, they also then asked me to look at other groups. And that's why there are three other chapters on Protestant groups, including the Church of Scotland, where I got to go as a visiting scholar at the University of Edinburgh. They too had um, a prayer that was said in the 1980s, and a motherhood of God controversy, which in the end their theologians said was all right. And it's in their hymnals now. So um, that's a little bit of the odyssey of being here with the community. The chapter that the daughters reflect, I ended up writing about the four qualities that a congregation needed in order to present female imagery in song, in writing, in ritual, and in art. And it was a charismatic leader, which you certainly have had in your community, a community that supported it, which you certainly had, the wisdom circle groups that prepared the materials, the wisdom circles you all had, the colloquiums that were put on, and now with fire in our hearts on the internet, with uh, the Wisdom Year material being written by um, Ann Nielsen and others, um, there has been a community that prepared this material. There is also a call to evangelize. Your community, um, like the others, felt a strong need, and you did it through the call of Vatican II to find the charism of your order and when you came to love of eternal wisdom as your founding document, and when people came in and gave you the wisdom that came from that wisdom in the scripture study, which many of you only got invited into after the church opened things up after Vatican II, um, you did this acceleration of learning and knowledge that was breathtaking to learn about and to meet you, especially those of you here that lived through that time, the amount of grace and spirituality and commitment to God that developed in new ways from what it was before Vatican II was breathtaking. And you said yes, and you stayed, and you lived with it. So the last one, and this is what the Daughters chapter focuses on, is that each community was courageous enough to talk about their personal experiences of God in a feminine form, or with a feminine voice, or with a feminine characteristic. Because as much as we could say it's in the Bible, as much as we could say there are leaders telling us we should, what it took in every community was some of the members publicly saying, or just saying to a friend, you know, I'm finally reading a prayer that matches a special experience I had where I heard God speak to me in a feminine voice, where I felt God wrap her arms around me like a mother would her child. 
and this image and this prayer and these words um, speak to me in such a deep way. And mostly those experiences happen at critical junctures in your faith life. And they don't only have to be female images, but since we were studying that, many of you sat with me and quietly and humbly but very sincerely told me stories and especially the pre-Vatican II stories were not to be shared. I mean the the way you were formed was you keep those private. So um, it was an honor and a privilege to hear about this. Um, some of the sisters shared their crisis of faith and how wisdom actually brought them to their faith in terms of what they could live and believe, a very grounded God that grows through every leaf, every plant, every flower, that um, inspires and leads you in new ways, who is with you no matter what turn your life is taking. And then for Wisdom Incarnate, for you following St. Louis de Montfort to be incarnate wisdom in Jesus is so beautiful and ties in completely with the tradition of the New Testament. So um, those are some of the things. If I have, do I have just a couple minutes to share another story or two? Um, one thing as to be, to write as a scholar was a little, I was learning how to do this for my PhD and you're supposed to not really say this is the truth, you're supposed to say they say that's the truth. They say this is their spirit. I'm not saying that mystical experiences are real, I'm report, but they believe it. And I found those dissertation ways to write that kind of couching things. But there was one time in the book where I wrote about my own experience and it was with the daughters. In this story, um, one day I was about ready to leave and two things happened very quickly. One is that there were some books that Sister Mary Eileen, as your archivist, said that I could have a second copy of to use. Mm -hmm. We had them in a box and your generous finance office gave me $20 to pay for the postage, which I was supposed to do on my way to the airport. We come back into the room and the $20 was missing. And we're like, where did that go? Where did it go? Now you're going to have to help me because in the book I call her Sister Lucinda, but it's, I gave her another name. You had a sister who, when she was alive, would put things away in places where nobody else could find them. Who was that? In the provincial house. In the provincial house, yes. Yes. I, I lived there. I never lived in the provincial house. One year. I did. And she was there. Mary Eileen prays to all the time. Who is it, Mary Eileen? St. Laurentine. Laurentine. St. Laurentine. Oh, St. Laurentine. I think it's one the Laurentine. Okay. She every Yes. So all of a sudden, like other Catholics I know who pray to St. Anthony, they're praying to Sister Laurentine. Laurentine, where is it? Where's the $20? I'm like, Where's that sister? I haven't met her. And then they told me. And I thought, this is extraordinary because you're still in community, even as transition happens with the characteristics and the gift that they have brought to you. So that was the first thing. Um, but as when I was in there talking to the finance office about uh, this, um, a phone call came in. And it was from your Maria Regina. Is that the yes. nursing home? Is that? Right. And it was that another one of your sisters had passed over. And um, it was a very sad phone call. And I, uh, and they took down the information. They said, we have to let everybody know we're going to put out an announcement. Well, it was Sister Claire. Oh, God. Okay. Um, it didn't really register with me exactly. I'm not sure if they said her name, but... Finally, Sister Mary Eileen, who had been working feverishly all week, finally let me into the storage where all the archives were kept. For the week, she was like, oh, it's not ready, it's ready. And she would just keep bringing me boxes of things. Right here, I'm about to leave. She says, you can come have a tour. Of, and it was beautiful. I can't imagine. It was so, it was clean. Everything was organized. She must have worked so hard all week. So we're walking around the shelving, and I notice up at the top there were two boxes that said dissertations. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wow, 
For all of you that did any type of master's work or PhD work, every one of your dissertations were in one of these two boxes. And I said, Sister Mary Eileen, I would love to see what some of the sisters chose to write about. So we took down one of the boxes and we opened it up, and on the very top was a, a master's dissertation that Sister Claire had written. Now, I'm, I couldn't, we were trying to figure this out last night. It might have been Sister Joan or Sister Virginia were with us in there. And they, like, looked at each other, and they looked at me, and they said, we are the house that organizes the funerals. Mm -hmm. And we were going to have to write about her life, and none of us knew that she did a master's so early in her life. This is a gift. Well, again, the goosebumps happened. Mm -hmm. And what I write in the book is that I, as a researcher, it, was, it took my breath away because it's one thing to come and visit and share and, and try to represent what you're saying, but it's another to be the telephone cord for Sister Claire, who would just to make sure that the funeral committee knew that she had gone to masters. It's only because I asked for that, and, we opened, and I, I and I thought, okay, there is something you, as the daughters of wisdom, have. It, and my part was so small as the little telephone cord, but I felt it, and I write about it. And what I say in the book, and even all the academic advisors who read that they thought I I wrote it really well. I just said. That was the moment where I wondered who I actually was in this research. You know, I wasn't, I was no longer an observer. I was a participant um, many times. And those of you that I got to sit with uh, know this. I was so taken into the envelope of wisdom with you. And um, it's only with the grace of wisdom that this dissertation became a book. And that uh, people now are asking about wisdom. Um, the book is just starting. I, you know, it came out in paperback about um, in 2015, and um, I was telling um, Sister Anne that um, it's now being used in two seminaries that I know of. Wow. Um, the first run in hardback was for research libraries. It's at Stanford University Library. It's in the Library of Congress in Australia, in the United States, and in Scotland. And um, I'm asking people to help us get it into public libraries so that if anybody really wants to know, they can find a copy. Um, I just want to show one thing, and we can pass a book around for those that you haven't seen the cover. The cover itself, even if people don't want to read the book, it tells the story. Because, if you, I'm going to just um, maybe just come around quickly. You can see here that God is touching fingers with Adam. This is from the Sistine Chapel, but his other arm is around a female. Can you see that? Oh, yes. Can you see how he's touching fingers with Adam, and here he's with a female? And so this is a very familiar image. Here, I'll do this for the camera here. That we all know the image of God touching fingers with Adam, and we don't pay attention to the other side. Now, on the Sistine Chapel, she is not as pronounced as the cover of the book, but um, but um, the graphic artist for SUNY Press drew her out so as you could see how well defined. And that's all they did. They didn't change the coloring. They didn't change the image. Yeah. And... Um, on a slightly, this is a slightly off-color little little comment, but I think it's very precious. So, and I know the daughters of wisdom, you're very earthy women. <laughs> My mother said, "Oh, this is a beautiful cover of the book." My mother is 88 now, and she said, um, "Anna, the Sistine Chapel, how beautiful!" Well, a couple hours later, she called me and said, oh, "Elizabeth, do you know?" that she does not have a top on. <laughs> and she said, what will your Aunt Jessie say? My <laughs> great Italian aunt who goes to church every day. And I, <laughs> so I said, well, Mom, you, you can tell her the popes have been saying mass under that image in the Sistine Chapel for centuries. I think if it's good enough for the pope, it should be good enough for us. So, um, 
so that's uh, those are just a few of the words. Um, I'd like to maybe now uh, turn it back to Sister Anne. Um, for me, the wisdom scripture has been to see myself, my body, in images that reflect the divine of God. And um, in some of the literature that is promoting the book, it says, Christian women, we are told we are in the image of God, but when do we get to see it? And those of you that have done all this beautiful work um, are just asking us to see us fully, that we, male and female, are made in the image of God, and, and it's something to celebrate, and it draws out other ways of seeing God and other ways of embracing God. So maybe that will lead us into our reflection, that Sister Anne will lead us. And then after that, if you have any questions, I'm happy to chat and talk. Why don't we just take these few moments um, just to reflect back on what we heard and uh, what we feel is surfacing within ourselves um, this, at this moment. So a few moments of silence. I was interested in seeing that in in the book, in the four groups that you interviewed, yes. that all three of them, well, three of them anyway, had a real pushback from either their found their churches or uh, their con their parish their parishes or their congregations against their thoughts or their teachings, except for us. And I was just wondering if you had any comment of why you think the others had such resistance to the message, and yet we, we don't seem to, as a group, have invited that sort of thing. That's a very, um, I'll wait for the microphone, a wonderful, wonderful question. Thank you. I think you've been nominated to be the microphone person. <laughs> <laughs> it might be my job. <laughs> we won't find out. Okay. Um, uh, so the question is, um, how is it that the other three communities had, I mean, ministers that were brought up on heresy charges to be excommunicated, um, the BBC and the Church of Scotland covered the bad treatment that Anne Hepburn and the Church of Scotland faced, and um, the community of Lutherans in San Francisco doing her church were, were marginalized as well. I think um, one of the big things is, well, twofold. One has to do with how you handled it as a congregation. And number two, um, I think it's because you are a congregation. The other three were directly working with um, a very wide range group of people that came to parishes for church. And much of what you were doing for your prayer work 
um, is here for yourselves. And then with people that were involved in your ministries, mm -hmm. and then creating ritual and prayers and song to support your ministries. So in some ways you might have been a little more homogeneous, but honestly, Sister Eileen, for you down in Mullins, West Virginia, to have been doing that early work in the 70s, um, I think women's networks were very open in the 70s and 80s to some of to this material. But the reason why I think the pushback happened um, in these other locations, um, now this is just me, this was my voice and, and people could disagree, but I think women's ordination was such a major issue during those years. I really think this imagery came forward as women finally were allowed at the PhD level, doctorate level to study scripture, language, liturgics, church history, and they were looking in the Bible for images. So that came out during that time. And a lot of that was to put forward the argument for women's ordination. In the case of the Protestant chapters, all three of those groups ended up allowing women's ordination at some point. Um, but those decisions, as you know, within the Catholic circle was never an easy one. But the Catholics had a more hierarchical model that, as Bar Sister Barbara and I were talking about, when decisions get made, they're made. So, um, in some ways, the daughters, you found the spaces for your own spirituality within the structures of the church to um, explore what the church was directing you to do. So, there wasn't... Now, um, Sister Anne mentioned, since you brought it up, the Andrew Harvey weekend, part of this was be because he was not speaking from within that tradition, and then there were some who came. It was a wider open colloquium that included others. And then people started to ask, you know, what is this? Where does this fit? So, um, so I think one is how you handled it within, the daughters handled it within the structure of their denomination. But I think the other thing for the Protestants is that just because they allowed women's ordination did not stop all the gender dynamics and issues mm -hmm of the women's movement hitting all of us in America and Europe. Mm -hmm. And for many, if you come to their sacred image and want to change it, it's like, okay, you can give me a women priest or a women minister, but darn if you're going to change anything on the altar from what I had as a kid. Mm -hmm. So I believe a lot of the pushback was the second level of the debate of the same issue. And so, um, in many ways, once women had the authority on the altar, or there were groups that asked for alternative imagery, when it was um, a very broad range of people coming to the worship, they, many of them, that was the last place they wanted to see change, because everything in their world was changing when they left church, and that was supposed to be the one rock they wanted to stand on. And one interesting thing is the Church of Scotland, I brought it forward to the seminarians today. And that is a national church, they're Presbyterian, and um, not as many young people are doing the religion. So for these young seminarians, they are balancing their need and call to express God with so many words with the needs of the people who that is their rock. And maybe if they had left the church for many years, they only remember the prayers as they were said 30, 40 years ago. And so from a pastoral perspective, what's interesting is those seminarians, the new people, the younger people, they, they don't feel like they need to change the scripture or even their liturgy, but they change it when they read it. They make inclusive language on the fly as they read the daily readings. When they told me they did this, I said, oh, like I didn't believe it, honestly. So I quizzed them. And, I, and they started to show me what they just automatically do. And they said that the female imagery as they bring it is not, um, they bring it in when it fits with the scripture and when it fits with the message, when it's something feminine, something about another aspect of God that they want people to open to, and they never have an issue. So I think a part of it was time. I think a part of it had to do of its partnering with the women's ordination questions. 
And I think for your group, it's because you had this beautiful space to explore within the directives of what the Catholic Church was asking you to do. I often wonder if it, if it wasn't because of the Catholic devotion to Mary that we, in some way, were used to speaking about Mary, we say she's not divine, but to us she's very close to it. <laughs> and that we all already had a sort of an opening there. Uh, you know, I'm going to gonna stand up. There's no reason. I'll yeah. just come devotion, over. devotion to Mary. Yeah. And the second thing, the second thing that I thought of was, and I had this, I had this experience when I was in Malawi, that whenever there was a movement of the spirit, especially around devotion to Mary, you had all of a sudden the ruckus and an outpouring of, of rejection and uh, hostility. Uh, and so I just wonder, and I often think of that as our history, that was the real movement of the spirit, I think, to relook at that charism. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that that might be what was happening I, I would say absolutely. Um, one is, you're right, as Catholics we all grew up with female imagery around us. We also had the tradition of saints, which a lot of our Protestant brothers and sisters did not have. Some do, but not all. Um, so having some type of female imagery was comfortable for us. Again, not Trinitarian, which is what the Sophia work brings in. Um, but um, what I found is that if you're comfortable with your that female image of Mary, people tended not to want to extend into Sophia, right? And if I'm going to go ahead and say this, um, for some, since Mary um, was presented as an ideal that hardly any, well, no human woman, well, who had a baby and was a virgin, and who, uh, you know, who bore God, you know, um, plus. Um, just, but that that was somehow a model to aspire to um, place such a high standard that during the women's movement, some people said, no, I need a new image of feminine and femaleness from the Bible to inspire me. So that's the other piece of it. Um, actually hearing about the new uh, congregational material on Mary that you had, I think this past year was that, Sister Barbara? Um, it was very exciting to hear how um, Mary was um, integrating with, and the Sophia teachings are now so well integrated. Um, I think it says a lot about just this journey. It's, a, it's an unfoldment, mm -hmm. and we're living into it. Just as another thing that I heard from Marie Chiodo is the social justice and the spirituality in these last 10 years have also emerged. There's something just, um, and now hearing about your new inter, international intercultural community here in America with a Peruvian, a Colombian, and two American daughters of wisdom, there's something um, new, dynamic, integrating, and synthesized for where your community is, is going. And... Um, if that's not an expression of Lady Wisdom, mm -hmm. Anne Gray, who wrote a play about it and got to play her, <laughs> I might say. Thank you. Sister Ellen. Just going back to that, that whole thing about the pushback, um, an interesting thing, when, when the Methodists, when Susan Caddy and Hal Tussick, was really mostly Susan Caddy, because she was a woman, uh, was brought up on charges of heresy in... Um, in Philadelphia, they had asked several of us Daughters of Wisdom to go and present our ideas, you know, in support of Lady Wisdom. And it was Sister Claire, yes, thank you. and Don Mullen, and myself, I think it was just the three of us, that drove down there and we had a, um, an informal meeting with those that were opposed to this whole idea of Sophia. One of the problems they had, and I think this is any time you introduce any kind of change, uh, they read uh, Wisdom's Feast, the book, and they heard Susan saying that Jesus is female. That's what they heard, and they were stuck. 
on that, and that's why they wanted to bring her up on heresy charges. We went in, and Claire looked at them and said, what's your problem? We've been living this for 250 years. You know? I mean, they, they were like... And, and then they looked at us and they said, well, we called the Bishop of Bethlehem, the, uh, Pennsylvania, and he never heard of you. So I just looked at him and said, well, you should have called the Pope. <laughs> because, because we are a papal organization, and I'm not surprised that the Bishop of Bethlehem didn't hear of us, you know. But they were just so stuck on something different, and they weren't going to, and, and they, they misinterpreted it. They misheard what they read in, in the book. You know, it was a great experience. And, and to see Sister Claire with her gray hair yeah. and her wisdom of years, just yeah. look at them and say, so what's your problem? But <laughs> even better than that, how Pausick and Susan called me in Philadelphia about this meeting. It was of the uh, Methodist, United Methodist Conference. Yes. And said that they wanted a daughter of wisdom to go and uh, talk to them. I thought they were inviting me. And so I said, well, I can't go. I'm in medical school. And Susan said, oh, we don't want you. We want Sister Claire. <laughs> <laughs> so there. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Eileen. Uh, yes, as a matter of fact, um, in that story about the telephone and the dissertation, yes. it was Sister Claire. Now, yes. when I realized not only was it um, what had happened, but also that she was the sister that had gone and spoken on their behalf, mm -hmm. it was very, very touching. Um, I have stayed in touch with um, Hal and Susan. Hal, because he still goes to the American Academy of Religion, right. and um, Hal has made a career out of um, the Gnostic, uh, the Nag Hammadi Library, all those texts, extra biblical texts that have been found. And um, so he has developed a lot of grad students. And this interesting thing about wisdom, who's female, who becomes male, very interesting in terms of gender work. That is one of the few moves in the Bible of incarnate wisdom that actually helps our LBGTQI community. One of the few. And so theology is moving in, in, a, in, in a new direction. He's very excited about it. He said, you know, certainly it's not my generation's theological questions, but it is for the group coming up, and wisdom is still present, even in this new way. Um, so um, I just wanted you to know that. And um, also for those of you that might have served in Malawi, the Church of Scotland chapter of Anne, um, Anne Hepper, and she served in Malawi as a missionary. And after speaking to Marie, I called her, and yes, Anne in Scotland, who is now 91, remembers the Daughters of Wisdom, who referred to themselves as the Wise Guys of New York. <laughs> and she specifically remembers a sister skyscraper, was her nickname. And I think we figured out last night, Sister Edmund? Edmund. 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 Is probably who she meant. So that means out of the four chapters, three of them, Susan Katie and Ahel Tausig, the Daughters of Wisdom, and the Church of Scotland, you've all had some connections, which is kind of amazing. And Sister Eileen, I just want you to know that even though the chapter was written on the Daughters without any names, the one person who is named in the book is you. Because you ended up writing in the United Methodist newsletter, newspaper, in support of Susan and Hal and your friendship and devotion to each other. Um, and I had to footnote it. And nobody's found that, but I just want you to know. <laughs> I only got it with a big name there. <laughs> That's I've been sitting here making so many connections, I'm not even sure I can get them out. <laughs> but um, it started when I, I mean said something that this is a movement of the spirit. Okay? And I went back to Vatican II, would go back to your roots, which was that charismatic, finding the gift of the spirit that was common to all of us. And thinking, I think it was 
you, somebody said, yeah, must, I think it was you who said it earlier, but I've forgotten exactly the quotation. But I'm very um, aware of the fact that historically in the Catholic Church, after every major council, there's been a movement, a charismatic movement, and a rediscovery of the spirit. And certainly we had a very strong charismatic thing in the country. And they said usually about 50 years later, there's a very strong mystical movement, and mystical theology and mystical spirituality take the floor. Well, Monfort's spirituality is a mystical spirituality. And when I listen to your story about Sister Claire, and you know, it just happened. You just happen to say, I'd like to see what they wrote in their things. Things like that, it seems to me, have, have happened throughout my life, and I'm sure throughout a lot of our lives. And you wind up in a different place, in a different position, and, a di and things you never dreamed of. I, I really do believe that's the spirit, it's of the spirit. And I've become very firm about the fact that ours is a mystical theology, or mystical spirituality, if you will. Absolutely. It's of the spirit, and you cannot shape it the way you want it. You can only keep exploring it and let the spirit speak. Well said. <laughs> I'm remembering that your Dutch province sponsored a theological treatise on the mysticism yes. of. Yes. Yes. I remember a lover's letter to his lover. You love it. You love it. You love Beloved. It. Oh, somebody else say it right. Go ahead. Somebody uh, the remember the title, Barbara? Yeah. Yeah. Just because yes. we have this on oh. film, even though I'm running around. Lover. With a lover's letter to his beloved. Oh. Oh. Mm -hmm. And that too was a thesis. <laughs> well, um, I would like to ask if um, the one thing I said I wanted to do also, not just to talk about where we've all been, but also to hear where you see wisdom developing and going. I was very touched to hear how much of the congregational material and the wisdom years and the fire in their hearts are developing. And um, I, I was sharing with uh, Barbara and Anne earlier that two things in terms of being moved by the Spirit and not knowing where it's all going but I, I very much want to be in service to whatever happens next, and I say this to Kathy as a provincial right now. Um, I, uh, it looks like I'm going to have an opportunity to serve on the board for the Parliament of World Religions. It's the largest interfaith organization in the world, and they've asked me to serve on the Women's Task Force. And then yesterday I was at the United Nations, and there is a group forming that is looking at women's equality and faith to bring together um, the groups that are working on both issues with UN Women. And Anne was reminding me that UN Anima is the NGO that you work through. What I'm hearing from multiple corners, a little bit like maybe these waves of when mysticism comes or uh, when things change and then the, these kind of echoes, there is a resurgence, and Anne said this ha is happening, she's seen it too, at the United Nations of an embracing of the role of religion in shaping culture and understanding. And um, I can tell you, working in this area of gender and women, that it, this is happening as well. It, there's some type of resurgence, and it's happening from a much more synthesized, integrated place. It is not as much about protest, which has its role. There are times where things need to break in order to reform. But there's something that's expanding, I guess, mm -hmm. is the way to say it. Um, I had an opportunity last May to travel with 10 scholars to Jerusalem in the West Bank. And we were matched with our colleagues at universities there. And um, every single university we went to had a women's program. Most of the scholars there are Muslim. But what I saw the Muslim women doing within their culture and within their religion was very inspiring and very similar to how the movement for women's rights here has happened in the States for the last 40 or 50 years. Um, so there's a lot to be done, and you're an international 22 countries. Um, 
your outreach and your touching and here as Catholics, as Christians with the Bible, this very woman positive way of supporting the life of women in all varieties in all countries is very strong with you. So I know I just went on for a little bit, but anything you might want to say of where you hope wisdom might lead or where you're feeling or noticing new places or new insights of what wisdom is bringing. Um, let's, okay, great. What comes to me strongly is um, the world is hurting in so many ways. It needs compassion. And um, not that I want to say all men are not compassionate, but it is a quality that will provide the energy that the world needs to work towards healing. Uh, it's exciting, and you can see it. I could go on and on, just Stephen. I, I, they're saying no, so I'll say no. <laughs> well, well said, especially during this year of mercy, right? For this Jubilee year of mercy. I, I do believe. And, and just to also support what you said about it's not just women. I mean, masculine and feminine are in all of us. And those of us that have gotten to live or even be socialized into more feminine ways. I think back to the high school that um, Virginia and Joan were at. Do I have that right? With the teachings of wisdom and how they changed, how they even administrated their school. Mm -hmm. And what that did to encourage the students instead of ranking them. Finding each gift. Celebrating the diversity of gifts. And um, that came through living as wisdom. Identifying with those feminine qualities and then sharing it with everybody so everything can <coughs> improve. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing um, a real convergence of, um, of women being out there in the front. There are so many organizations that I intersect with. Uh, UN Women, um, I'm with Zonder, and you've heard me talk about Zonder, and I don't know if you've intersected with them at, um, at the UN, but we are an NGO. And we work for the advancement of women worldwide, and we're in 69 countries of the world. Um, and there's a real uh, sense of oneness and giftedness of women and working for that. Pax Christi that we uh, support is um, an NGO also. So I think that there's a lot of promise and unanimo that we are uh, you know, connected with. There's a lot of promise. If we listen, you know, to what these organizations are saying and support what they're saying, I mean, did we ever think that we would have a woman candidate for president in the United States? There's been a real openness, I think, to the to the quality, and we have more women in Congress than we ever had in the past, and I I think that um, there's a real appreciation of the feminine in today's world. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, I think especially um, now in terms of the studies of the new cosmology, I think, for instance, of the work of Barbara Marx Hubbard, um, I believe the hat of wisdom is at the heart of, of what is happening in terms of our, the evolution of our consciousness that that um, is her work. And I, I remember uh, my own excitement when I was listening to Barbara Marx Hubbard, and she talked about the, the experience of the, the divine coming through that whole spiral that she works with. I said, that's Sophia. That's, you know, that's wisdom. And so um, at this, again, at this moment in, in the evolution of, of the consciousness of, of humanity, who she is, um, I think, is is just um, a wonderful gift to appreciate and to keep exploring. Right. It's it's mm -hmm. of the time, of the moment. Anyone else? 
I always thought of wisdom, uh, the qualities of wisdom from the uh, wisdom books. And one of those that always struck me was that wisdom permeates and penetrates all things. And um, of course, wisdom, if, if you know, wisdom is a, an aspect of God, so God permeates and penetrates all things. But wisdom as feminine permeates and penetrates all things. And I think that has something to say about our our discussions of gender and uh, the, the unity between masculine and feminine that is it masculine uh, things that penetrate all things possibly but feminine certainly the feminine permeates and penetrates all things that's wisdom so maybe that has something to help us with uh, the gender situation. Beautifully said. Um, and I think with where gender understandings are going is it, it is more fluid. And um, if anything, I'm noticing with my younger students uh, more of a freedom to really be who God uniquely made them to be without being told it can only be this way or that way. That my hope and prayer is that all that is leading us to everyone being able to be the fullness of how God made them. Yeah. Anyone else? This is all very wise, I must say. <laughs> <laughs> what else would I expect? Well, you know, I think maybe let's end the formal part of our program. Sister Ann, I'll turn it back to you, and then we'll have informal time to have more conversation. Thank you, Elizabeth, and thank you, everyone. Uh, the sharing was um, really, it, it, it brings everything to a heart level again, as well as a head level, you know? Uh, and Sophia is at the center of our lives. And I think your invitation to, to go from here, to go forward, is so important. You know, um, and, and how can we continue to share with the world this gift that is ours, all right, this mystical uh, gift? Um, how can we do that within the time and the limits that we have? I think it's a question we need to nurture. How can we do more to share wisdom with the world? Uh, it's so important. Um, and we're very grateful, Elizabeth, for your continued contact with us. Because uh, as you were telling me on the way out, you are co-chairing a number of wonderful um, committees, Women Caucus, the Women Women's Caucus, caucus yeah. Women's Caucus, uh, and that's with the. Beth, could you tell yeah. us a little bit about that? Um, sure. Um, in uh, in academic settings, and some of you know this, um, my field being religious studies has the American Academy of Religion, and um, the theology, more Christian departments, um, was the Society of Biblical Literature. The Society of Biblical Literature is the largest religious academic organization probably on the planet. And the American Academy of Religion, which looks at the cultural, historical, social aspects, which is more my area, um, we're smaller, but we're still big. Our conferences get between 10,000 and 12,000 people, mostly academics. And when I was in Europe, the European academics often only come to that because that's the only place they can find people that have their specialty. Um, I'm now co-chair of the Women's Caucus. There are a number of organizations in this, but our group spans both the AAR and the SBL. We have grown, I'm co-chair, and we now have a leadership team of close to 20 scholars around the world, and we're about to produce a film on different uh, women-oriented theologies for classroom use. And um, so we're doing what we can to help. Um, so that's, 
that that's probably the the main thing that I'm trying to help with. I'm also chair of the women's studies committee at my school, and um, I appreciate that my, the book was actually published with a women's studies editor, which was my hope that not just religious women take interest in this and read it, but that women that are interested in just greater equality and freedom for women would read this and understand why religion has such an important piece to play in a positive way with women's independence and empowerment and self-expression. Thank you. I'd like to present you with this gift. Um, it's a book written by uh, Rabbi Rami Shapiro oh on his um, revisioning of Love of Eternal Wisdom. And I know in the book you mention the statue in the chapel at Wisdom House, yes. and that is oh the cover. Oh my gosh. Oh, again, so. more goosebumps. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you so much, Sister Kathy. I would love, actually, you know what? I would love it if people would sign this. Who's ever here and who would like it, just to put your signature in this. It would be such a such a treasure for me. And to let you know that Rabbi Rami Shapiro, I got to meet him at Wisdom House. It's one of the last things I did in, in this research. And um, I actually saw him at this last Parliament of World Religions in October. Oh my gosh, it might even be online. He now does a radio show for, called Spirit Matters. He interviewed me, and he specifically asked me to speak about the daughters. There's a 15-minute radio interview online of Rabbi Rami interviewing me. And because he knew you the best, he had me talk about the daughters. Thank so, you. So thank you. This is really precious. Okay, well, why don't we leave the book here, and as I come around and talk, if you would like to, uh, just come up and sign your name. On the inside flap, it, it would be a real treasure. And any of you that brought a book, I'm happy to sign the ones you brought. Thank you very, very much.